king of Assyria, the Assyrian, has sent his messenger, Rabshakeh, to taunt Zion. And the point there was to get them to give up. So they wouldn't really have to waste resources on fighting. Just give up. We're so powerful, we're going to conquer you anyway. Let's just get this over with. Just give up to us, and then we'll move on to bigger and better things, like Ethiopia and Egypt or something. And so that was what they were trying to do. At the end of the, the chapter, verse 21, remember the response of the men. There were the three men there, sent from Hezekiah. Uh, and their response was that they held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. Which is interesting. The king's commandment was answer him not, and they obeyed the king. There's some loyalty there, some fealty, some obedience. Okay? It also should remind us of Proverbs 26, verse 4, which in Proverbs 26, verse 4 says, answer, a fool, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. If they would have responded like this person in his folly, oh yeah, well you and your mother too, you know. Uh, now they're just like them. Okay? So they didn't answer him according to his folly. Proverbs 26, 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly that he not be wise in his own conceits. And we'll see that tonight as God responds to the taunts. So we see in this, the chapter here the application of Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to their folly, so they don't, they're not like them in their uh, blasphemy and lies, but answer a fool according to his folly, lest he think he's wise in his own conceits, which of course Sennacherib did. Right? And so this is God's rebuke of him. So we'll see that in tonight's chapter. But that's the response of the men. In verse 22 it says, they, uh, Then came Eliakim, the son of Hil Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Repsheki. And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes, and covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. And we see here in these first two verses something of the character of Hezekiah and his response to these taunts, these threats, from at that time was the greatest threat in the world. Okay? And there was no worldly hope for this city, this small city, uh, of which the Assyrians have conquered larger and uh, more impregnable. Okay? And, and so this is Hezekiah's response. His response is to rent his clothes and cover himself with sackcloth, and he sends the priests and his me messengers here to Isaiah to consult with him to pray to God. And he goes to the house of the Lord. He went to the house of the Lord, verse 1. And so what's his response? And the, there's so much preaching you can do from chapters like this. Because his response was not to run in fear, was not to give up, was not to answer and say, well, if you guys are offering an offer, I guess we'll take it. Of course he didn't do that. He understood what God had told him to do, which was not to, to ally with these people. Hezekiah was a faithful king. He trusted in the Lord. And so his response was to rent his clothes and sackcloth. I want to spend just a, a minute or so on this. Um, you could say he was reckoning himself dead. That's a, that's a Romans verse, isn't it? Romans 6. Paul says to reckon your, your, yourself dead unto sin and dead. Uh, that's what he's doing. When you cover yourself with sackcloth, sackcloth was not only a humiliating covering as opposed to the kingly robes, but represented death. It was burial cloths. You bury people in sackcloth. Right? I mean, it's just how humble it was. It's like, well, they're going to be in the dirt. Let's put sackcloth over them and put them in the dirt. You'd bury people in it. So people putting on sackcloth, sitting in ashes, as the Bible talks about, were made of dirt, was a symbol of death. I am worth nothing. I don't deserve to live, that type of thing. Okay? And so that's associated with the renting of clothes, which I have these nice clothes on. I'm renting them, tearing them, and then I'm putting on sackcloth. Renting clothes or rending clothes means to tear them. And that's associated in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you see this a lot. Even in Jesus' ministry, you'll see the priests rend their clothes when he tells them things about who he is. Rending clothes has to do with, with either being afraid, I'm fearful for my life, and so I'm, I'm tearing, tearing things, or distress, or quite literally, you're breaking something. That's the symbolism there. They rent their clothes because they're, they're breaking this thing that, they, that was once their protection and covering. Right? They're breaking it or causing a schism. Remember the priests when Jesus, they were questioning Jesus, and he answered it what they thought was blasphemy, which was him declaring himself to be the Son of God. They rent their clothes. Why do they do that? Because they were saying, we don't want to be associated with this blasphemy. They were separating uh, by the, the symbolic act of renting their clothes themselves from what he just said. Okay, there's blasphemy here. Oh, I can't take that. I'm separated from that. It's like verbal filth or something, right? And so that's what they did. And of course, that was the wrong side. They should have accepted what he said. But they rent their clothes and say, we're, 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 we're dividing ourselves, separating ourselves from this. And there's a break here. 
right? There's, uh, and of course, other times it could be because of fear or distress. Um, my life is broken. I'm broken down renting your clothes, right? So the rent of the clothes followed by putting on the sackcloth is the, the breaking yourself or recognizing the fear and distress and, 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 re- and associating yourself with death. So here's Hezekiah reckoning himself dead, and then he positions himself with the Lord by going into where the Lord dwells in his house. Okay. And I only bring out that spiritual uh, you know, extraction from the verse, because this is very similar to the response we ought to have to distressful situations. The difference is important, but it, the similar response is reckoning yourself dead and remembering your position with the Lord. Because know you not, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And know you not who you are and where the Lord was. So, so this is how we respond to situations. Now the difference is that Hezekiah is not in the body of Christ. He didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him as we do. And he didn't have the same position we do in the body of Christ. So we didn't, he didn't have the same position. He had to go to the house of the Lord. But he knew that's what he needed to do. I am nothing. I can't do this. I'm going to reckon myself dead. What does God want? I'm going to go to his house to find out. Right? And so you see how people can preach this for everybody, spiritually speaking. If you don't understand the dispensational difference, you're going to make a mess of things. You're going to say that well, this building is where the sanctuary is, and this is, you need to come here to get God's words or something. That's not true. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit today. But his response was one of faith. Okay, it was one of faith, because he knew it wasn't about his strength. He was the king, but it wasn't about his strength. He was the king, and he rent his clothes, saying, this blasphemy I just heard, I want to separate myself from that. I will not blaspheme God. Because remember the words that were being spoken. The words by the taunt was, don't trust what God has promised, that, that he'll save you from me, right? And he hears this, and he goes, no, I will not agree to this, right? Rents his clothes, puts on sackcloth, and goes to the house of the Lord. Does that make sense there? So I, I just I want to give the insight, because you'll see that over in the Old Testament, where they wear the, sat, the sackcloth, there's a, there's a point to that, and they rend their clothes. Um, anyway, but moving on, you can teach a whole lesson on the rending there. In verse 2, he says, he calls Eliakim, who is over the house, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, uh, and he sends them to Isaiah the prophet. He sends them covered with sackcloth. So again, in the same position, right? That I'm not sending these people in some sort of great authority. I'm sending them humbly to request from God's prophet what God would have us do, or to request of God something, right? Now, this is a, a good position to be in, because this is contrary to King Ahaz some years before Hezekiah, who never left his pedestal. And because he was king, he thought it gave him authority to reject this advice from the prophet. I wrote a, a tip a few, uh, a couple months ago about the Bible not being good advice. And at first you're going, what do you mean? It's great advice. It's not advice. That's the point. Advice is something you take as counsel and you can accept or reject it. The Bible is not that. The Bible are, is instructions, truth, yeah. commandments. So it's not just good advice. And when you, when you think about the Bible as good advice, you're the one deciding whether to take it or not. You need to be in the position of whatever you say, I'm going to take. And that's the sackcloth, right? That's like, I'm deaf, you are God, right? And so that's the idea here. But notice what he did. He sends the priests. So you have the three, the men who went out to talk to Rabsheki. But now you've got included in this group, the priests, the elders of the priests, This is interesting, because in Israel's day, you had priests, you had prophets, you had kings, and you have all of them here, right? And in this unique time in Judah's history, the priest, the prophet, and the king are all on God's side. That's amazing. Okay, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, And so he sends these priests in sackcloth to the prophet, something to remember about the functions of these positions. Priests were men that represented or spoke for man to God. Men had problems, men had sins, so a priest would take a sacrifice and mediate with men to God. Prophets were people that spoke for God to men. So prophets, they also spoke, but they spoke God's words the other way, right? So we have this interesting union here. The king's supposed to be taking these actions for God's nation. He sends the priest speaking for man to God, and he sends them to the prophet, supposed to be speaking for God. What you have here is men talking to men. But really, it's God and man through the prophet. So this is, again, a, a, a faith. Because do you believe Isaiah is God's prophet or not? Why is he sending him to Isaiah? Because he's God's prophet. Ahaz rejected this. Other people in Zion rejected this. Hezekiah didn't. Isaiah was God's man. This, verse 3 is how, what he says to tell Isaiah. They said unto him, 
Thus saith Hezekiah, the, this day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It says, It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And so we have the description here in summary of Hezekiah saying to Isaiah, saying to God, it, the day of trouble is here. The day of trouble, by the way, that we've been reading about for the last 30 chapters, that God says it'll be a day of trouble, day of trouble, and it'll get worse and worse. And we've been drawing the chart and saying, well, this is the tribulation, a shadow of the tribulation. But it also has its immediate fulfillment here, right? And this is the day of trouble. They're about to be destroyed. The whole world's against them, right? So it's a day of trouble, a day of rebuke, a rebuke against God's people, because the, remember, the, the towns around Zion had all been conquered, right? Uh, and Israel here is, is put in a helpless position because of their sins, remember. This would never have happened if Zion, if Israel, Judah had, dis, uh, had obeyed the covenant of God. So there was a day of rebuke, and a day of blasphemy, of course, because this is what it's come to. Instead of, of enemies of Israel being far away from God's house, outside of the borders, they're right there in, next to the city, speaking in earshot and blaspheming the God of Israel, right? So it's a day of blasphemy. And for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. The idea there is the pregnant woman we've seen over and over again in Isaiah's language, his metaphorical language, about uh, 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 the, the travail that happens in pregnancy. But we're right before the child giving birth, which is the hardest time, but it won't come forth. So it, the prayer is, this needs to be done. Something needs to be done. Now, God promised to save them, right? The Assyrians promised to destroy them. We're right here. <laughs> and Hezekiah goes, this is the time to do something, right? And so Hezekiah is making this request that uh, th this is the day. We need some help. And a remnant here, we've seen that remnant show up many times in Isaiah, is waiting on the Lord to avenge them. Now, he says a day of rebuke, knowing that the majority of Israel had disobeyed God, and that's why we're in the situation we're in here in Isaiah 37. But he says at the end of verse 4, Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for who? The remnant that is left. Because there's a remnant that believe you, God, that believe your prophecies, that trust what you said. And so for the remnant's sake, right, pray for them, right? He doesn't say pray for those that deserve it. Pray for those who are waiting on the Lord. Remember, we studied in Isaiah 30, the 30 chapters there. Waiting on the Lord, seeing and not being blind to what God said. There's a remnant who actually did that. Just like in the New Testament, there's a remnant that did follow Jesus. A remnant did wait on him. Okay. Now, this also should sound familiar because this is right, right before God shows up. And it's at the darkest days of trouble. And I can draw my chart again, but hopefully you have it in your mind. There's the day of tribulation right before his coming. Right? And Revelation, it should remind you of Revelation chapter 6, where it goes through those seals. And the tribulation gets worse and worse. You have the war, and then you have the famine, and then you have and the fifth seal. Do you remember the fifth seal? It's after the four horsemen. You have that fifth seal, which is the prayer in heaven, where the saints who have been martyred say, How long, O Lord? Let's look at Revelation 6. How long will you wait? <laughs> will you... Let's read the passage specifically. 6 verse 10. They cry with a loud voice. They opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Right? How long? Now, the next seal is the answer. Right? The sixth seal, you got the great earthquake, you got the signs in the heavens, and you got the coming of the Lord in the day of wrath. So how long? Here, now's the time. Sixth seal, right? So this is the question uh, Hezekiah is asking. He's saying, will you hear this blasphemy? And perhaps if you hear it, this, this blasphemy of reproach in the living God, you'll reprove the words for the remnant's sake. Right? That's what he's saying in verse 4. And so Hezekiah knows the time in which he's living. He knows what's going on. He knows the prophecies Isaiah has said. And he's making an appropriate prayer. That's intelligent prayer, Right? So Hezekiah, by the way, his prayer and his, the, the, what he knew about what was going on didn't begin the night before. We studied Hezekiah's biography last week. Hezekiah had been doing right for a while. He'd been following the law, reading the law, and he wrote a copy of the law. He knew what was going on. 
So he studied in times of peace so that in this time of distress, he goes, I know what's going on and I need to pray this proper prayer. Right? And we'll see later, even though this is a proper prayer and a, a wonderful prayer, it's not only because of his prayer that God does what he does. He'd already prophesied it, remember. But that's the right prayer to pray. It's, it, it, what it indicates more than a, a requirement of God, Hezekiah's heart. And that's why it's a good prayer. His heart's in the right place. His head's in the right place. You see? So it's interesting. Revelation 6 talks about that, that fifth seal, and this is where Hezekiah is at in this tribulation. Uh, the child's about to give birth or won't come out. We're at the end here. Something's going to happen. The Lord's going to come. Okay? So verse 6, what is the response? Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, which is a famous prophetic phrase. This is a prophet speaking for God. Isaiah, a man, is saying, Thus saith the Lord, and then he speaks, because that's what the Lord told him to say. Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. You see the me? They don't blaspheme Isaiah. This is God speaking through the mouthpiece of Isaiah. Okay? So he says, don't be afraid. I've heard the words. He says, I've heard the words wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria. He's kind of mocking him there because the king of Assyria didn't say them directly. He had to send messengers to say it. You know, not only is that an insult to Israel, but it's an insult to the king of Assyria because he didn't have the courage to say it to my face type of thing. Why didn't he come up and say it? Right. And so he says, the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So essentially he says this. Notice at the beginning of verse 7, he says, behold. What's that mean? The look. Right, yeah. So he says, don't be afraid in verse 6, and just watch. Don't be afraid, wait and watch. So again, the advice according to previous prophecies was for the remnant, for the believing faction of Israel, to not try to seek help, but just to be still and wait. Right? That was the instruction. At this late time, God's saying the same thing. Don't be afraid, wait and watch, because you're about to see something. Right? And he says, I'll take care of it, essentially. Right? He's going to hear a rumor, he's going to leave, he'll send a blast upon him, is what he says, and he'll fall by the sword in his own land. Now that's a prophecy that's come up again, uh, previously. Okay, um, so the blast and sword, by the way, this blast that he'll send and this sword killing the Assyrian is fulfilled in this chapter in verses 36 through 38. Okay, the blast is the angel of the Lord killing the majority of the army, Amen. right? And uh, the sword is what happens after he runs back home to Nineveh, and then his sons kill him with a sword in his temple of his false god. So it's fulfilled in this chapter, right? Uh, these two things, the blast and the sword, have also been prophesied previously, if you recall the last 40 studies that we've done. Okay. By the way, as a note of Bible translation, I have to say something here about the word blast. Because the ESV, the NIV, uh, the New American Standard, uh, these, these more recent English Bible translations change the word here, among many commentators as well, even conservative ones, change the blast to he'll send a spirit. And the idea there is he'll send a spirit upon the king of Assyria to cause him to go back, right? Uh, and the reason why is because the Hebrew word is the same Hebrew word that's translated spirit many other times in the Old Testament. But not every time. There's a major fallacy among translators, and I know you aren't among the translators. We don't translate here, we study here. Yeah. But there's a big fallacy, even in your own language, to consider that just because a word means something most of the time doesn't mean it means the same thing all of the time. Right? So if you're translating, you can't just say, well, that word always equals that word. It doesn't work that way. There's a broad definition. Words have different definitions. You have to look at the context. And in this context, the King James is superior. And that's a rare statement. Many people say, well, this is one place they got it wrong. I don't think so. I'm perfectly fine with it, especially since it gives me the cross-reference to the very chapter in verse 27, where it says, Therefore, their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field. And it says at the end there, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. The word blast is defined in the chapter as corn that's blasted before it grows up. What's that mean? Blasted before it grows up. Well, the corn's trying to grow. Something hits it, and it can't grow up, right? So what's, what's the blast do? What's it supposed to do? It's some, it's some force that hinders it or destroys it from Bearing fruit or growing, which is the precise Webster's definition of the word blast, Amen. right? Now, the word blast can refer to winds. A cold wind or a hot wind or a dry wind hits this plant, it's going to hinder its growth, right? 
a sudden blast of it. And that's where the commentators go. It means spirit, as like a wind, because they like the spirit, the wind combination. Blast is perfect, because blast means a sudden influence. Amen. And in verse 36 of the chapter, God suddenly affects the army of the Assyrians in one night. Yeah. Right? Also, if you go back to Isaiah 25, verse 4, there's a prophecy about this. Thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. Can you find out what the word blast means from this verse? You can. There's a storm coming. It might hurt your crops, right? There's heat coming. It might distort, <laughs> destroy your crops. A blast coming. wonder what that's going to do. Destroy your crops, right? In Exodus 15, verse 8, you don't have to turn there, but it talks about the blast out of the nostrils of God that made the winds, that hindered the, or hindered the waves from falling and lifted up the waters. Remember that? So God parted the waters, and Exodus 15, 8, and that song there talks about the blast out of the nostrils of God that hindered the waters, prevented them from flowing, and it held them up. And all the new Bibles translate the same word blast there. Why don't they translate a blast in Isaiah 37? I'm... Just something to consider. Okay, the blast is, I think, the much better word. You say you, what you think doesn't matter, and you're right. Believe your Bible. Okay? Yeah. Let the words be. They're just fine. And that blast gives you a cross-reference to later in the chapter. Okay? Anyway, that's not the point of verse, of verse 7. He'll send a blast upon him. And it talks about the sword here. Um, the sword was prophesied before in Isaiah 14. This sword of, of which the Assyrian would die from had been prophesied multiple times. So you're reading through this history, and you're going, there's a lot of details in this history. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, when there's details to the history, it's because God wants them there. And in Isaiah specifically, God has prophesied many of these details before. Isaiah 14, 19 says, Thou art cast out of thy grave. Now Isaiah 14 is all about the destruction and fall of the Assyrian. Isaiah 14, 19, Thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword. See that? And what the fall of the Assyrian with the sword. More clear is Isaiah 31, verse 8. Isaiah 31, verse 8. Remember? Remember we studied this? Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, his young men shall be discomfited. So he flees from the sword, and he dies by the sword. If we covered back then, how can you do both? He flees the sword of the Lord, and then he dies by the sword of his sons. And so the prophecy in Isaiah 31 is very clear. Isaiah 37 is the fulfillment of this. So just one more prophecy to add to that list about the dying of the sword of the Assyrian. So it's been prophesied before. Uh, the blast on the, the thorns. It says he'll send him a blast. Look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. Remember back in Isaiah 10 is where we first got introduced to the Assyrian being the rod of God's anger. Remember that? In Isaiah 10 verse uh, 17 says, The light of Israel shall be for a fire, his holy one for a flame, and it shall burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. And verse 19 says, The rest of the trees of this forest shall be few that a child may write them. So he's going to destroy this forest, referring to the Assyrian army. And what left is only be a few, that a child can count them. Children can't count very high, right? And so in verse 17, you see where it says, the fire shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day? What helps you here is what we studied back in Isaiah 10. And Sister Carol gave me a note about this a few weeks ago. The name Sennacherib means bramble of destruction or the thorn that's laid waste. It means the thorny bush is destroyed. That's what the name means. So when Isaiah prophesies the Assyrian army is going to burn up and his thorns will be devoured, this is mocking his name, you see. The Assyrian's name, which by Isaiah 10, we didn't know his name yet. Isaiah 10, Sennacherib wasn't the king of Assyria. So it's prophesying who the king of Assyria is before he's the king and how he's going to die. God's prophecies are amazing. But he says the Holy One will devour his thorns and his briars in one day. That's Isaiah 37. That's Sennacherib the bramble of destruction, the thorn laid waste, whose army gets destroyed in one day. Right? So we covered that in Isaiah 10 months ago. But I'm just showing you here in Isaiah 37, in just the telling of this history, that there's prophecies that were talking about these things that are now being fulfilled in every verse. Okay? 
Moving on, Isaiah 37, verse 8. So we have this prayer to God, this request to pray for the remnant and for him to reprove these, this army. Isaiah responds with, don't be afraid, just wait and watch what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy them, essentially. Verse 8, so Rebsheke returned and found the king of Assyria. Now, the return here is return to Lachish, where Rebsheke came from, a town south of Jerusalem. We saw that last chapter. He returns there uh, because apparently the king of Assyria didn't have his back anymore. You see, what happens, the king of Assyria brought his army up to Jerusalem, sent his messenger, Rebsheke, up to the walls to consult with these guys. And then the king of Assyria leaves. Well, you know, the messenger's going to leave if the king leaves, because maybe we're not fighting the war today. And that was the case. He returns. He found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, another town. And so he, he returned to, to support him there, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And so he wasn't going to attack Jerusalem immediately. Okay. And he heard say concerning Taraka, king of Ethiopia. Now, th th what's going on here is that the threat is temporarily removed. And many people say, well, that's God's prophecy being fulfilled here. But it really isn't because there's no blast, first of all, right? Uh, there's also no falling by the sword here, right? Uh, you could say, well, this is where he heard the rumor. Well, that could be true as well, but it also works later in the chapter also. But he heard say concerning Taraka, king of Ethiopia, and this is what the Ethiopian king said, he has, come, he has come forth to make war with thee, and when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah. So, what's going on here is that the Assyrian is trying to take over these lands. He's taken over all of Palestine. He's trying to move west a little bit. And Ethiopian Egypt is west of, of Israel. Okay, Jerusalem's there, so he's like, we're going to ca capture Jerusalem. He taunts them, then realizes it's going to be more difficult than we thought, because they go back to Hezekiah to consult. So we're going to capture Libna first. So they capture Libna, a town west of Jerusalem. And here's from Ethiopia, a larger nation, that we're going to come and get you. Ethiopians are going to come and fight them. Now, it's not that the Assyrians were afraid of the Ethiopians, especially if you realize their arrogance. They've already conquered so many other nations. Ethiopia is just one more. But Ethiopia is a lot larger threat than Zion in their eyes. So they're going, Ethiopia's coming. We need our 185,000 soldiers from Jerusalem. Right? So, they're, so that's what they're hearing here. So he's got to send word to Hezekiah to say, look, give up. Because if he gives up, the soldiers come and help him fight Ethiopia. Is that, are you following me, military generals here? Right, so he needs those soldiers to fight the greater nation, but he needs Jerusalem to give up before he does so. So he sends messengers to Hezekiah again, and now this time of letters, because he's in a different place fighting. He sends letters there saying, you can't win, give up, you know, just stop. And so verse 10, thus shall you speak to Hezekiah. This is the letters or the final messages from the Assyrian. Final because he's going to die. Um, he says, Then shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. So I know you're consulting amongst yourselves. Don't, don't let your God deceive you. Right? Uh, you're going to be destroyed. That's just the fact of the matter. And, and behold, thou hast heard what the king of Assyria had done to all lands by destroying them utterly. See, he's not afraid of anybody here. He's just trying to get his army. He wants these guys to give up and get it over with, right? So he's done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? What makes you any different? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed? So this is a multi-generational empire. This isn't like some rogue gentleman who's conquered the world here. His father and his father reform and his father reform has built this empire. We've destroyed famous legendary nations. We do this for a living. We do this every year. And you're next on the list. What makes you think you're going to stop my father's father's campaign that I'm continuing? And we're huge. I, I, this is the summary. I'm paraphrase, right? He says, my fathers destroyed these nations and have, have the gods of those nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden. That's an interesting reference. The children of Eden. Like the Garden of Eden? Maybe. There's some other Edens in the Bible, but the, where is the children of Eden? Which... We're in Talassar. People are looking for that place. Where's that at? But all these places surround the Euphrates and the Babylon and, 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 and those places in the east there, which, not coincidentally, is probably where Eden was at. Like this, this land, these rivers there, talking about that. So could these be actually children of Eden that tried to find the place that Adam and Eve were kicked out of? Maybe. Another study. Not important to understand the context of the chapter. I'm going to say that, and someone's going, that's neat. I'm going to figure this out and become a Bible scholar. That doesn't give you Bible credibility. Fun to study, 
but that's not the one, top 100 most important things in the Bible. But it's fun, okay? So he says, haven't my fathers destroyed these people? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arphad, the king of the city of Barpham and Hena and Eva? Where are these people? Included in the list are the, the places where Abraham's father came from. Remember that? Over there in the east there where Abraham left? Well, they've been captured by the Assyrians, it says. We've captured all these places. So where are their kings? Where are these nations? Where are their gods? And that's what he's taunting. And so his, his letter of taunt here um, doesn't, it repeats essentially the blasphemy of the last chapter. If you remember the last chapter, it's the same type of thing. Only now at the very beginning in verse 10, instead of saying, don't trust your king. Remember last chapter was don't trust Hezekiah who tells you this. In verse 10, the taunt now says, don't let your God deceive you. Well, I mean, it was bad enough blaspheming what they did before, but now they're just calling God a liar. Don't trust your king. That's one thing. Don't trust your God. He's lying to you when he says he'll save you. Can't get more direct than that. You see, so he, he is contrary to the God of Israel. Okay. Um, by the way, I just had in your reference on the outline there, another remembrance of a prophecy in Isaiah 20. We won't go there right now of the Assyrians defeating the Ethiopians. Okay, and so this whole thing with Ethiopia there, go back to Isaiah 20, it talks all about the Ethiopians, how Zion shouldn't trust them, because even though they have a great army, the Assyrians are going to capture them and lead them away captive. And that's what they did. They were fighting the Ethiopians, they weren't afraid of them, they were going to capture them. Okay. So the Assyrians are more powerful, they've been destroying nations, and here Hezekiah has another response to these taunts, these letters. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. You see a similar response of faith as before. Uh, Hezekiah, by faith, gives this letter to the Lord to read. Look what it says here. He went up into, unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord, as if to say, Lord, read this. Okay? Um, false gods don't read. We'll see this come up in the later chapters here. In Isaiah 40, 40, 41, 42, it talks about false gods and mocks them, what they can't do. And this is one thing they can't do. They can't read. I mean, obviously made of wood is stone, you know, but you put something in front of them, they don't know what it says. He puts this letter down. God not only can read, but he created language. Yeah. You know, he created, he's the creator of those things. So he puts this letter down and says, God, read this thing. Look at this blasphemy they've said against you. And he does this, not because, again, because he's shaking in his boots, though there is some fear here, but there's a greater fear of the Lord. And, and that's the idea. He's bringing it to the Lord, you'll see in his prayer, uh, uh, because by faith he knows the Lord can stop this. Right? And so he prays. And so you can preach lessons as we started to do tonight on prayer. The proper response to distressful situations that you can't handle is prayer. We talked about prayer a few weeks ago on Sunday, and... Praying is good. Making requests to God is good. The thing that differs dispensationally is what God is doing, which is how he will respond to your prayer. Right? So how he responds to Hezekiah's prayer may be different than how he responds to your request in Philippians 4, 6, which is that the peace of God keeps your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? So that's the change. But the fact that you face distress, we all face distress, we have throughout history, the fact that you can't handle life, that's a common thing among humanity. For thousands of years, the fact that you need God to live, that's also very common. Even in this dispensation, without God and His Spirit dwelling in you and His grace, how do you live day by day with all your bad, bad circumstances? So, prayer is necessary. It's God's response that changes. And what will help you is for you to know what God is doing, so that when He responds the way He told you He would respond, you expect it. Because the false expectation is what drives people crazy. I expect God to respond as He did to Hezekiah. And he doesn't. And now you either have to question, do I hate God or do I put up with him? You know, uh, well, if you knew what God was doing, you wouldn't have that failure to expect. You would say, well, I know what God has done. I know what he's doing today by grace. And so I don't expect him to do that other thing. So what happens if you do get healed? As you were saying, I'm sick and I pray for healing, if that's your request. Okay, you're alive. But you can't say God did it unless he said he was going to do it. Right? I don't want to talk about prayer tonight. The, the fact of the matter is Hezekiah responded rightly once again yeah. with consulting the Lord with prayer even. Okay? And so he, he, he's here in the house of the Lord praying. Verse 16, or verse 15 and 16. 15 is the verse that you can, you can preach from. Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord. 
Yes, you need to pray unto the Lord. Verse 16, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, and this is Hezekiah's prayer. We'll study this a little bit. Thou dwellest between the cherubims. Thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Do your prayers sound like this? You say, nah, not all the time, not really, no. <laughs> uh, this is what's called blessing God. Uh, we might teach a lesson on blessing if people want, want to hear that sort of thing, what it means to bless and how can you bless God as if I can give something to him? Well, it's not as if Hezekiah has something to offer him except praise, right? And that's what it means to bless God. And often in the Old Testament prayers and in the Psalms, you'll see verses like this. Well, he hasn't even got to the request yet. But what he's doing here, he sets this letter down. And the blasphemy is, your God is worthless. And Hezekiah prays to God saying, you're not worthless. I know that, right? That's faith. Right? God, I know you're all powerful. God, I know you know all things. God, you are the maker of all things, the creator of me and everything that makes people how they are. You're the creator of emotions. You're the creator of, you know, that should, just acknowledging that in your own prayer give you some comfort. But it also blesses God because it, it, by faith, makes you articulate that he is greater, far greater than your problem and who, who you are. And this is what Hezekiah is saying. He, he, look, he says, O Lord of hosts, Zion has a small army, right? Now, Hezekiah didn't say that. I mean, we read that before. They had a small man army, but he said, we outnumber them. Why? Because God's on our side. Because he's the Lord of hosts. He's got a greater host than any army on the earth. And he actually believes it. That's why he prays it. O Lord of hosts, hosts are his armies. God of Israel, which is going to be unique. The God of Israel is not like the gods of these other nations that dwelleth between the cherubims. That harkens back to the temple. You had the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was, was, was created with the cherubim wings over the, the, the mercy seat, and that was where God's glory and holiness dwelt right there, um, a seat upon which God would, his presence would be uh, in the Holy of Holies. So he dwells between the cherubims, his throne, right? So he dwells between the cherubims. Uh, thou art the God, the God, the only God, is what he's saying here. Even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, Thou hast made heaven and earth. So you talk about him being the creator. So he's not, he's, he's not saying here, God, you're the God of one nation on the planet. You're the God of one kingdom. He says, you're the God of all kingdoms of the earth because he made all of the earth. And that's true. Right? Even today, God is the maker and creator of all things still. So the fact that God is not controlling a nation or hasn't given a covenant with a nation doesn't deny the fact that he has made everything. God can do what he wants. And for any king to say, well, your God can't do it is blasphemy. But what we do know is what God is doing. If God can, why doesn't he? That's the accusation of blasphemy. We can say why. He doesn't because he's committing his love towards you today. He wants you saved, even when you blaspheme him. You see? So you can speak as God has given us his will to be. Anyway, Hezekiah here is blessing God magnifying him. Blessing means to praise, to glory, to magnify, to exalt, right? It's very similar. There's many prayers like this in the Old Testament, many Psalms like this, including the disciples prayer. The prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray began with what? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I haven't even got the request yet because they're recognizing who they're talking about. He's the Father of Israel. His name is hallowed, right? He's in heaven. Then they make their requests. This is, this is the blessing of God in prayer. People say, well, how can I pray? You know, you can pray a good prayer just blessing God for who he is and what he's done and, yeah. and all that he is greater than everything else. I mean, that'll, that'll lift up your spirits a little bit. But meanwhile, he goes on to verse 17 to make his request. He says, incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach the living God. Now, here's his request. And his request, as it did before, shows knowledge of the covenant, knowledge of what God is doing, knowledge of what he should ask for. Now, he says here to incline your ear and open your eyes. God sees everything. God hears everything. That's an attribute of God. He's omniscient. But what's Hezekiah talking about here? Like, God's forgetting? He's, like, distracted by something? I mean, what? He sees everything. Of course, God will respond like this. But he's praying this according to the covenant. Because covenantally, God said there were situations where he would not hear your prayers. 
And by that, it wasn't that my ears are blocked. It's that because of your disobedience, not answering him. Because of your disobedience, it's going to look like I don't even see you. It's going to look like I'm absent because of your disobedience, right? And uh, let's go back to 2 Chronicles 6 just to see this. Because 2 Chronicles 6 is the sanctification of the temple of God in which Hezekiah is standing, right? And 2 Chronicles 6, we have King Solomon, arguably one of the greatest kings in Israel, right? And he, this is before his fall, so he's, he's here building the, the temple. Is David's son, right? Uh, in, in Solomon's reign, Israel was the most glorious. David built Israel the way it was, and, and Solomon took, took the capstone, uh, a, 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 a shadow and a type of Christ, right? Also a shadow and type of the Antichrist in his fall. So you got that problem. But 2 Chronicles 6 is, is when he built the house of the Lord, built the temple, and he consecrates it. And he has this prayer in chapter 6, lasts the whole chapter. Look at 2 Chronicles 6, verse 19. He says in verse 18, Will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. So, you know, this house can't contain you, Lord, but we're asking you to dwell here. That's what you told us to do, to build this house for you. Verse 19, Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prays before thee, that thine eyes may be open upon this house day and night, upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldest put thy name there, to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prays toward this place. See what he's saying? You told us to build this place. You told us to build this temple. You said you're going to dwell here. So he's praying to God and saying, open your eyes and may your eyes always be open in this place. Your ears always be open on this place, this place, place. That's important. In this dispensation, is there a specific place God's eyes are open and ears are? No. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, remember? That's the connection between you and them. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, you're not. That's a change in operation. God's eyes and ears are always open to you. You're not under a covenant. But here the prayer is, in this place, may your eyes always be open and your ears always hear. Yeah. Right? And that's where Hezekiah is standing. Why is he going to the house of the Lord? Because that's where God always hears and sees. Yeah. Right? And so that's why he's there. Look down at verse 34 and 35. He goes on and on, praying this prayer about the consecrating of this temple. In verse 34, if thy people, and he gives these circumstances, if, my, if the people do this, then please hear. And if the people do that, please see. In verse 34, if the people go out to war, against their enemies, as Hezekiah is facing his enemies in Isaiah 37. By the way that thou shalt send them, and they pray unto thee toward this city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built thy name. So you see, the city and the house are important. If they go out to war, and they pray toward this city or in this house, then what? It says, then hear thou from the heavens their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. But what if they're sinful? as it is, it is the case in Hezekiah's day, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sins not, well, that sounds Pauline, doesn't it? And thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, as has happened in the days of Hezekiah. And they carry them away captives into the land far off or near, which has happened to Israel, the northern tribes, and some of the, the, the cities of Judah. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land where they carry, uh, whither they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their captivity. He says, Hear their prayers, verse 39. Right? That's an important place. Hezekiah knows this. Remember in, Hezek in 2 Kings, it talked about Hezekiah saying, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed after his father, David. Where do you think Solomon learned this? David. Right? David taught his son. And so, Hezekiah is following this, knows the consecration that Solomon gave to Solomon's temple. And he went to Solomon's temple, laid the letter out, and said, Open your ears and your eyes, Lord. He wasn't just saying that because I want you to see you saying it, because there's a covenantal re request there. Amen. Right? This is the time. We need you. And so, he was knowledgeable about that. 2 Chronicles, 30, or 2 Chronicles 6, verse 40, at the, the very end of the, the chapter, it says, O Lord God... Um, now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine ears be attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Hezekiah is in the place, making a prayer. Okay? Prayers under God's covenant to Israel could be hindered if they disobeyed. 
Jeremiah eleven fourteen talks about prayers uh, not being answered. It says, don't hear their prayers, Lord, because of their sins. Jeremiah eleven fourteen. therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. You don't want to be in that in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah's talking about Babylon, right? Hezekiah is that faithful king. Matthew 5, 24, Jesus talks about this, the hindrance of prayers, right? He says in Matthew 5 that if you have ought against your brother, what are you supposed to do? You're in the temple, you've got ought against your brother, leave the temple, get that right, then come back, because God won't hear your prayers if you've got ought against your brother, right? Or what about James 5, 16? Talking about prayers being hindered. Now, James, people think it's for the church today, which is shameful because James says nothing different than what Jesus taught in his earthly ministry before his resurrection and before the revelation of the mystery. But James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You've heard that, right? Bookmark verse. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And everyone has that bookmark because I'm the righteous man. Really? No, there's none righteous. But it does speak to covenant truth that if you're following the covenant, your prayers get, are effectual. If you're not, they're ineffectual. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about how you handle, uh, how you handle, how you relate to your wife, your, your behavior to your wife. And it says to, 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 to behave towards them a certain way, else your prayers be hindered. Your prayers. Like, that's serious. If you don't treat your wife right, your prayers aren't getting answered. Whoa! That'll make you change how you treat your wife. That's covenantal though, isn't it? Because God today does tell you to love your wife as yourself, right? And yet, He's not saying, if you don't, I kick you out of the body and take away your spiritual blessings. You see, that's a different operation. So, Isaiah 37, Hezekiah is praying in the temple, making a request according to the knowledge of the covenant. Incline your ear to hear, Lord. Open your eyes. Hear the words of this blasphemy, a blasphemous enemy which reproaches you. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries. Notice he called what this blasphemous idolater said true. Not all of it, but that part was true, right? So we need to be honest when you're talking about your enemies, talking about people who are teaching doctrine. You have to discern truth from error. You can't say because they're wrong that they're wrong about everything, right? Because it's true that they have laid waste all the nations and their countries. And they have cast their gods into the fire. Right? It's true. But I said, I have a truth. But he does contemn here their gods. He has contempt towards them. For they were no gods. He cast their gods into the fire. What's that saying? Not much. For they were no gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they've destroyed them. This shows you a little bit of Hezekiah's heart here. So as the taunt was, who are your gods compared to other gods? Hezekiah's going, yawn. Your gods, those gods are wood and stone. Remember last week we talked about this. The God of Israel, faith, the man of faith would have known it was much different than these other gods, which are no gods at all. So the taunts in this area at least had no effect on Hezekiah. He knows those gods were made of wood and stone. Nothing like you, God, Lord, or God of Israel. And so therefore they destroyed them. Now, therefore, verse 20, Hezekiah prays, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. So, he asked to save us. Why? To glorify God. To glorify God that all may know that thou art the Lord. Because the taunt is, you are, your God is no different than anybody else. And this city is, is no, like, unlike, uh, is, Nothing different than any other city, but it is, right? Now, this isn't just a matter of pride. This isn't like, well, our church is, is different than other churches. You can't make the same application. You can't say, well, my house is different than other. Well, you can't because God has anointed your house specially or our church specially, okay? But that city, that place, that temple, the people, he did give a special covenant to. So this is just Hezekiah's pride saying, we're different than the other nations. You know, we're going to... Against all odds. You know, no, that's not what he's saying. I mean, there's a, an actual covenant in words that God made who is a true living God who really made those covenants and really has the power to keep them. And he's appealing to them. Right? And that's what he's doing there. You're not under those covenants. You can't appeal them. 
You can only appeal to what God has given and promised to you, which is his grace. And that is sufficient. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So look at Ezekiel 36. He asked to save us that all may know. And he doesn't ask to save us because of our good behavior. He doesn't ask to save us because if he said save us because we've kept your covenant, that would have been a problematic prayer. Right? If he asked to save us because we just don't want to die, that would have been a problematic prayer. If he asked to save us because we want to show them that we are more powerful than them, that would have been a problematic prayer. It was all to God's name and God's glory and what he would be seen as in front of other people. And this is significant because this show comes up many times in Israel's history. Right? God makes covenants and promises to the fathers, to David. And over and over again, God keeps covenants at the time of, of necessary judgment against Israel. He doesn't destroy them entirely for the sake of the promises and covenants he made to those fathers. And essentially, for my word's sake. I can't go back on my own word. So it has nothing to do with you people. Right? You say, well, Israel is special. Only in that God created them, but not a single generation was special. It was not in that. God created a nation, but he can rise up another generation of Israelites, as John the Baptist said. So any given nation, they could all be annihilated, but the, the, the nation would not be removed. There's all, there would be a remnant, right? But Ezekiel chapter 36, now this is the chapter talking about the new covenant to Israel and Judah. And it's talking about how God's going to give them this new covenant that will bring them salvation, right? And finally forgive them and save them forever. And Ezekiel 36, 20 gives you the reason why he does this. He doesn't say, I do this because I love you guys so much. I, I, I'm so generous and it, you guys, it's just a good time being with you. Because that's not the case. I mean, just like all of us, Israel is just, a, just an example of the rest of us, that we're all sinners and constantly grieve God with our sin. We need his grace, right? So why in the world would God give Israel, as people say, a second chance? Why would he give them a second chance? Because they didn't deserve a second chance. Now, you might say, everyone deserves a second chance, and that is your Christian bias speaking. Only in the Christian West, speaking sociologically, is that even an idea? Because in other places where natural and proper justice, not proper in this case, justice is, ta is, is, is taken out, there is no second chance. You break the law, you kill someone, you rob, you steal, there's no second chance. Guilty. Mercy is an attribute of the God of the Bible. Right? Grace is something that God dispensed through Christ. So Christians learn this from the Bible, from God, and they say, well, God saw sinners and still was willing to save them. And that influences your culture. So much so that when people get offended, they're not even Christians. They have this thought of, well, everybody deserves a second chance. Are you Christian? No, what are you talking about? No, that's just a general rule. From Christianity? You know, it's not natural to think that. Right? God committed his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sinners don't deserve a second chance. Right? That's why they call it grace. Right? If we deserved it, it wouldn't be grace anymore. Anyway, Ezekiel 36, new covenant given to Israel. And it gives the reason why. Verse 20. He's, God scattered the, the Israel among the heathen. They were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of the land. So Israel bore the name of God. Israel was, you know, is one of God's names, God's people, right? And Jehovah was their God. So when he scattered them to judge them, which from Ezekiel's past, but from Isaiah's future, he scatters them and all the nations are mocking them their God. Their God can't save them. <laughs> their God's worthless, which is a blasphemy against his name. So the fact that God had to judge them and the nations mocked them because they were judged was a blasphemy against God. You see? Isn't that interesting? So they get judged once for disobeying. They get judged twice for blasphemy. Right? Anyway, verse 21. But I had pity. On what? Pity for my holy name. He didn't have pity on Israel. Like, they, they sin. They're transgressors. I pity on my name. Because my name didn't do anything wrong. They said I was worthless, but actually I put them there because I was judging them for their sins. I'm the righteous judge. And they're mocking me. I pity on my name. That's what he said. Right? He said, I pity on my name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen where they went. 
Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel. It would be any more clear. But for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. He's bringing that up. <laughs> right? Which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So God uses Israel to sanctify his name. And that's why he gives them these oracles and things and he keeps his promises. Okay. Studying Old Testament blasphemy and, and these laws and God's righteousness really should cause you to reflect about this dispensation of grace because we're not under the law. God's not treating us as he did Israel under the covenant. And yet we are the body of Christ. We yes. singularly bear the sanctification of Jesus Christ. And we, when we are profaning his name by what we say and what we do, that's horrible. Yeah. Okay. You say it's grace. Yeah, grace. But grace is needed to those who don't deserve it, which means they're doing things horrible. Why give, why give that reason? If you love God, as Paul says, you know, on those that love the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you bless them, but curse those who don't, right? He was talking about people who misbehave. Because you misbehavior, purposeful misbehavior, is you're saying, I don't love the Lord God or his name that he gave me. Because you're a member of his body. You say, that's not salvation. You don't have to love the Lord to be saved. You trust his finished work on the cross. But it's shameful not to love the Lord for what he did for you. Right? And so that's what Paul is talking about there in 1 Corinthians. But I just wanted to point out here in Isaiah 37, this prayer that Hezekiah prays is not for his own sake. And that's right. He says, save us, not for my own sake. For your sake, Lord. Your name is going to be blasphemed. Well, that's touchy with God. His name matters. Right? You know what matters above his name? His words. Wow. So, talk about Bible preservation, Bible inspiration. You, you say, well, don't touch the name of God. He's really sensitive about that. You're right. He's more sensitive about you changing his words. Amen. Right? Wow. There's a lot to that. Believing your Bible and keeping it as it is. Let's move on here. Isaiah 37, down in verse 21. The prayer is over. Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent unto Hezekiah. This is the response of the Lord. The Lord answers his prayer. He says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, again speaking for God, Whereas thou hast prayed to me, this is God's words, me, thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word which the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Now he's speaking to Sennacherib here, right? So God is answering Sennacherib and his taunts. And the taunts were, you guys are nothing, we're more powerful than you, your God is nothing, he can't save you, don't trust your God, don't trust your king. God's answer is, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughs thee to scorn. He doesn't respond with, those were naughty things to say. He doesn't respond with, well, let's talk this out. He responded with, we're laughing at you. He responds with, the virgin daughter of Zion is laughing at you. Now, calling Jerusalem and Zion a virgin daughter is not new. But what he's talking about here is that Zion has been uninvaded, like a virgin, uninvaded, okay? They've conquered everywhere around, but have not been able to penetrate Zion. Virgin daughter, right? Daughter, uh, uh, we saw that back in Isaiah, earlier in Isaiah as well, calling the city a daughter of Zion, has to do with its beauty. Uh, a virgin daughter especially is one to be desired, right? The daughters are ones to be desired. Women are, are ones to be desired. Lamentations talks about the daughter of Zion's beauty has been remo removed because of its destruction, right? But here, virgin daughter refers to the beauty of Zion, the, that in fact has been uninvaded, right? Also, he doesn't say the mighty warrior of Zion, the virgin daughter of Zion. I mean, this isn't exactly like, you know, him boasting in the strength of Zion. It's like, our women are laughing at you, that type of thing. So it's this image of this uninvaded, pure, because you've never been able to touch it, and it's desired, which is why you're trying to come after it, is laughing at you, which really gets to men. When women they pursue reject them, it either hurts or makes them angry. I mean, it either like, you know, kills their esteem or makes them angry either, either way. Rejection's hard. And that's what God's saying. He's essentially saying, you're being rejected. We're laughing at you, shaking our head at you. Sorry, don't accept your offers. Right? This is what he's saying. He's mocking them. He's laughing at them in derision, as Psalm 2 says. God laughs in the Bible, normally at people who think they can conquer him. That's the big joke. People think that they're more important than him. He's going, ha, ha, ha. He laughs in derision at them. Right? And that's what happens. 
So Psalms 2 is, is, is that as well. Psalm 2, 1 through 6, the heathen rage and they imagine a vain thing. Remember that psalm? And uh, it, it says that uh, the Lord laughs at them in derision. So Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed. Why do they do this? They say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the throne shall laugh. The Lord shall, shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That king is who? Ultimately Christ. In Isaiah 37, Hezekiah is a pretty faithful shadow of Christ. Right? So that faithful king's making a nice prayer there. And he, the response that he's going to give is that we're laughing at you. Like Psalm chapter 2. Isaiah 37, verse 23. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Again, he's speaking to Sennacherib. Who are you talking to? Who are you reproaching and blaspheming? Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. And that is the name preferred by Isaiah, referring to the Savior of the Lord in, in Isaiah many times, the Holy One of Israel is given. And we've mentioned almost every time it comes up that that's also a title given to Christ. In, in the book of Acts and the New Testament. So it's Jesus is Jehovah. He's the Lord. Yeah. So who are you talking to here? The Holy One of Israel is who you're talking to here. So again, he's got a little magnification. But he deserves it. Yeah. The Holy One of Israel does, is holy and deserves the magnification for what he's done. Sennacherib was boasting in himself, and he doesn't deserve it, as God will say here in a moment. He says, your boastings aren't really boastings. And he shows why. So he's not just competing in boast here. Right? God is truly magnified. Sennacherib has been put there. You can even claim on a human level, put there by his fathers. Har, har. But that's not even what God says. He says, I put you there. You're, you're trying to destroy me, and I put you where you're at. What do you say to that? Game over. I mean, you're talking about taunts. I mean, that, game over at that point. Who are you talking to? It says in verse 24... Uh, by thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord. So again, mocking the fact that you sent servants to me, not yourself. And hast said, by the multitude of my chariots, and this is what Sennacherib says, right? By the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountain, to the size of Lebanon. I will cut down the tall cedars thereof and, cut, and the choice fir trees thereof. I will enter to the height of the border and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up the rivers of the besieged places. So this is what Sennacherib says. I'm coming in with my own chariots, I'm destroying these cities, cutting down these trees. I'm stopping these rivers even, because they had to, to get water for their armies, and they went across rivers by damming them up and things like that. And so look how, look how magnificent we are. Sounds like America, right? Look at the things we've done. Yeah, okay, America's done stuff. Nothing compared to what God has done, Amen. right? And so be careful of that kind of hubris and arrogance. And this is what's going on here. Because in verse 26, uh, God says, Hast thou not heard long ago? Haven't you heard? You said you did it by your own. Now, notice how many times the word I shows up in verse 24 and 25. I am come up. I will cut down. I will enter. I have digged. I dried up. That's Sennacherib. Right? Careful of using that personal pronoun and things that you say and write. Because you going I, 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 I all the time is going to make people think that it's all about you. Right? So be careful of that. Verse 26, though. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? So this is God speaking. I have done it. Done what? Sennacherib said, I will take my chariots, come into these towns, and tear them down, and dig up these rivers. Didn't you hear that um, that was actually my purpose? I did this. And of ancient times that I formed it. I formed this purpose. And what's he talking about here? Go back to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah 10 is long before Sennacherib. Okay? We were here before, if you recall. Isaiah 10, verse 5 and 6. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is mine indignation. And we taught about how God would use the Assyrian as a tool, right, to defeat the northern tribes of Israel because of their, their sins, and as a tool to bring threat and punishment according to the covenant to Judah, right? He was God's tool of his anger. Verse 6, God says, I will send him against a hypocritical nation. That's the northern tribes of Israel at this time. And against the people of my wrath will I give him charge. We saw that last week where 
Remember Rav Sheke said, God told us to come here? And I said, well, it says here, God gave them charge. He didn't tell them the whole story, but he gave them charge. It says, and to take the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. God told them to do that. It was his purpose to do that. Howbeit he means not so. So the Assyrian, even though he's doing this for God's judgment and indignation and his purpose, the Assyrian isn't intending to fulfill God's purpose. Neither doth his heart think so. But it is, it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, the Assyrian, now remember this is before Sennacherib was even on the scene. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Uh, is not Calno as Carchemish and Hamath as Arphid? Aren't they, all these towns the same? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven image did excel them of Jerusalem and Judah, are not all their gods the same? Shall I not, as I have done in Samaria and her idols, so do Jerusalem and her idols? You see, there's no difference. Wherefore, verse 12, do you see the same taunts? God prophesied the taunt. This is what he'll say. He'll say he conquered all these people, and there's no difference between any of them. And that's what he taunted Jerusalem with. Verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. For he says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man, and my hand hath found a nest in the riches of the people, and so on and so forth. So why is he going to punish the Assyrian? Because he's not glorifying God. Because it was God's purpose this happened. God allowed that to happen. He only got so far as he did in Jerusalem because they were breaking God's covenant and God allowed him to do so as a rod of his anger. Verse 15, God says, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth it? Shall the axe say, I cut down the tree? Or did the guy bearing the axe cut down the tree? Right? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shakes it? Of course, it's not the tool that boasts. It's the person who uses the tool that has the boast. And this is what God says in Isaiah 10. And it's what God says in Isaiah 37. He says, haven't you heard long ago that I have done it? You are a tool. I have used you. So glory to me that you're boasting in what you're boasting in. Right? Isn't that amazing? If the rod sh should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. You're wood. Your, your vanity. I'm using you. That's what God is saying. Isaiah 37. Wow. I have done it. I have formed it. I have brought it to pass. He says, now have I brought it to pass. And Isaiah 10 was a prophesy, prophecy. Isaiah 37, it's a reality. God says, I have brought it to pass. This is fulfilled prophecy, folks. This is the greatest proof that the Bible is the word of God. Is when God says things will happen so specifically, then later they do. Now I have brought it to pass. Second Peter chapter 1, 19, Peter says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, right? He says, we've seen the Lord, but don't trust what we've seen. I'm paraphrasing. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Yeah. The prophets wrote what would happen, and they happened. Amen. That's how you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is God's word, and Jesus is the Messiah. Because he fulfilled prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Yeah. Just like back here in Isaiah 37. The Assyrian and Hezekiah are fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that God said would happen in the previous 36 chapters, right? That's how you know that this isn't just a storybook. How is this possible? Every man should be confronted with the historical reality that there are these certain events that have been spoken of hundreds of years before in great detail by one claiming to be the God who knows the future. What do you do with that? What, how do you respond to this? Who is this God? What is this book? It's unlike any other book, Amen. right? And so you see this, now have I brought it to pass in verse 26, yeah. that thou shouldest be to lay waste defense cities and ruinous heaps. I brought it to pass that you laid these cities waste. And he says, you will not lay this city waste. Amen. The guy who holds the ax is putting the ax down, yeah. right? You're not gonna go any further. So this is, this is his response. He says, therefore, that's why, therefore, their inhabitants, the inhabitants of these other cities were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb. God said, I prepared them that way for you. Remember? They broke my covenant, broke my covenant. They were disobedient, so I wasn't going to help them. There was going to be curse after curse after curse that weakened them. And then you came and destroyed them. I purposed it from the beginning. I put them that way on a platter for you, and you did it. So where's your glory, right? This is really making them small. They're, they were as the grass of the field, as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops. So it should remind us of Isaiah 40, where he says, men are as grass of the field, yeah. right? 
vanity, right? The flower of the field that fades away. The challenge is to not be that grass. And man, by his own effort, cannot be. But God talks about in the scripture of making you gold and silver that lasts forever, or making you a tree that has roots that last forever in the case of Israel. And so you're not the green grass with the Lord, right? That's the spiritual preaching from there, right? It's like with the Lord, you're not no longer vanity, right? Man is as grass and as an herb and as the flower of the field, unless you have the Lord and his eternal life and his eternal covenant and blessings, then you will stand forever, as Job said, in that day with my Redeemer on the earth. Right? And so this is the, the theme throughout the scripture. Right? We need the Lord. We need to trust the Lord. And so we see that um, in verse 27. Verse 28, But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. So he says, I'm the one who purposed this, and I know where you live, and I know when you go out, and I know when you come in. So he says, there's nothing you've done that I haven't seen. And these other things you're boasting, and I purposed. And thy rage against me, I know about that too, which is going to be problematic. Verse 29, because thy rage against me, and thy tumult has come up into mine ears, therefore will I put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. So that's how he ends. Because I purposed it, because I know you, and because you're my tool. If you want to be a wild beast, then I'll put the hook in your nose. If you're not going to obey what I say, then I'm going to drive you back with my whip, right? I'm just going to put the bridle right in there. And who holds the bridle? All right, who's the master here? The beast or the one holding the bridle? I'm holding the bridle. So he's like, I'm taking you back because I brought you here. I'll take you back. Because he's going to kick and buck and not want to obey now that he knows that he was brought here not on his own will. Well, you know, he's got a hook on his nose. He's got a ring in his nose. That's the hook. You know, wild beasts and animals, ox and others would have hooks in their rings in their nose that would allow the, the people to, to hook the ring and then pull their, their snout, right, to direct them. So that's the idea. So the Assyrian is just a tool, a raging beast of which God holds the bridle. Verse 30, he's now speaking to Hezekiah. That's the end of talking to Sennacherib. That's what he's going to do. Verse 30, this shall be a sign unto thee, he shall eat this year such as growth of itself, and the second year that which springs of the same, and the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat of the fruit thereof. So remember, he's talking to Hezekiah in this whole, this whole response. And he says, this is what I have to say to Sennacherib. And then he's saying, this is the sign that what I just said will happen, that he was going to go back the way he came, and I'm going to take him there. The sign is, for two years, you're going to have fruit without sowing, essentially. Okay, for two years. Now, this would have been the case anyway, since they were locked up in the city and they weren't out farming the ground. They would have to survive on just what they had collected, right? And uh, he says, this is, this is your sign, is that you'll have that, that fruit that you'll eat. This year will be enough, and next year it'll bear again, and you'll have the fruit. And he says, the third year you'll reap what you sow, right? Essentially, going back to normal, right? You won't have to deal with this anymore, is what he's saying. So the, the sign is you'll have these three years of uh, substance that will be provided, and in verse 31, and the remnant that has escaped to the house of Judah shall again take root downward. So remember, the Judah cities were taken captive or destroyed. He said, they're going to come back. Now, this is just the, the cities in Judah. Right? They're going to come back, it says, and take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now, that's speaking just a recent uh, fulfillment as they come back. Then later, they get taken captive again by the Babylonians. But uh, that'll be a sign that those guys come back. Verse 32, for out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. So there's a remnant out of the city, and there's a remnant from the city. In both cases, God cares about the remnant, which is saying something as well. No doubt there were people in the city who were not believers in God, and they were saved by virtue of the remnant, as far as God thinking about his promise toward them. But he, he, all of his promises and signs here have to do with this remnant of those that, uh, that believe and trust in the Lord. Okay, so uh, the remnant shall return. In verse 33, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, and this is quite a, a prophecy, He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. Cast a bank. He's not going to bring a, as they would, a, 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 a machines that they would climb on to climb over or build up a, a ridge where they'd climb over the walls. He won't do any of that. He won't even shoot an arrow in the city. I mean, there's nothing like that's going to happen. Okay. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. He says it twice. 
for I will defend this city. Now, what is he defending once again? Not the people, but the city. Well, for his name's sake, but it's the city. Okay, Zion is the city because this place is where my place is at. My name is in this place. Right? right? If it were just about the people, <laughs> they deserve judgment. It's his place and city. And he says, for my, I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. You say, why David? Well, David had a covenant from God. Right? He had a covenant from God that there'd be a king in Zion. He had a covenant from God to give him sure mercies. He had covenants from him. So for David's sake, Hezekiah, who followed his father David, this is why he's doing it. Right? Not, not, uh, not for all the sinners that he is indicting there. Verse 36, in one verse... Um, by the way, verse 30, 33 through 35 here, what he says about they'll never come in the city and he'll defend the city is the answering of Hezekiah's prayer. Yeah. That's the answer. He says, please reprove these people. And he's going, I just gave you a reproof of these people and I'm, gonna, I'm answering your prayer according to the covenant. According to David, mine own sake, according to the covenant. Okay, so he's answering it. Interestingly, Hezekiah's name means strength of the Lord which is similar to Ezekiel, which also means strength of God or strength of the Lord. Hezekiah, Ezekiel, very similar in the Hebrew there. Um, and we see throughout Isaiah these references to the salvation of the Lord. Isaiah 12, verse 2, they're singing a song of salvation and strength in the Lord. Isaiah 35 says, strengthen the weak knees. Isaiah 26, you'll find strength in the Lord. And this is Hezekiah's name, right? So these are prophecies before Hezekiah are talking about his name. In this chapter, you have Hezekiah, whose name means strength in the Lord, and Isaiah, in, in, in common unity, Isaiah means salvation in the Lord. Salvation in the Lord by his strength in the Lord. How does salvation come? By his strength, not your own. That's Hezekiah and Isaiah, and they're working together here, right? So it's interesting, just in the names there, you get this lesson about, um, about how to be saved by God. It's by his strength, right? Verse 36 then, we have finally, after so many chapters of prophecy, the day in which it's fulfilled that God delivers them. It says, Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand, it's hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And that's it. Anticlimactic. You thought some great battle, some, you know, ten plagues, you know, something like that. We'll go in the morning, 185,000 dead corpses. Suddenly, no threat. And it says, so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. <laughs> he just lost his army. And he uh, went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh, which is where he dwelt in, in Assyria. Uh, it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that uh, Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, smote him with the sword, fulfilling God's prophecy. And they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esar had in his son reigned in his stead. So you have the, the killing of the Assyrian by the sword, um, fulfills prophecy after prophecy. You have the, the Assyrian departing, which is saying a lot, folks. The Assyrian, as, we've, as he boasted himself in truth that he defeated all these nations and countries, is gone. He fled uh, Jerusalem. They have found archaeologically things that this king has written about his exploits, as they've done to other, for other kings of giant empires. And he writes about the exploits in Palestine and talks about how many cities, I think it was like 42 or 46 cities that he wrote that, that he conquered. He, he boasts in one place about making Hezekiah hide in a cage like a bird, but never says he conquered Zion. He never did. He, he ran away. He doesn't talk about him running away. He just, you know, conquered 42 cities. Hezekiah was like a bird in a cage and, you know, moving on. Because <laughs> what, what a shame it is that he couldn't conquer this one city. Of course, the Bible tells us why. So you have in one verse, in one night, God promises and prophes uh, his prophecies become fulfilled. Hosea chapter 1 talks about this. In Hosea 1, it says that Israel will fall, the northern tribes, but Judah will be saved, right? And Judah will be saved in, in one night there. And uh, so that happens that way. Uh, 185,000 here are slain by the angel of the Lord, is what it says in verse 36. Not a plague, not a storm, not mice or a disease. These are all offers that commentators, Christian commentators have given for how in the world 185,000 soldiers could die in one night. And they're looking at the same verse I am. And the verse says, the angel of the Lord. And they're going, hmm, I wonder what that really means. Uh, it means the angel of the Lord? Yeah. Right? 
Well, maybe a storm came through, lightning, maybe a disease, like one night, like COVID year 700 BC, you just killed them all in one night. Maybe my, one story was mice came in and ate their bow and arrow strings, so that's why they couldn't shoot the arrows over the wall. You know, it's like, or maybe an angel of the Lord just killed them all in one night, yeah. which has happened before. How will Israel defeat the Egyptian army? Maybe it was their military strategy. Maybe it was water that drowned them all. Yeah. Right? Maybe it was God doing that. There's an interesting study on the angel of the Lord and who that is. Uh, we don't have time to do that tonight, but um, there are references to that being the Messiah or not. But uh, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 32 as we finish up here. 2 Chronicles 32 gives us an additional detail about this day, this finality, this defeat of the Assyrian, and what happens afterward. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 21 the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. That's how you know it wasn't a plague. Because it was selective. He didn't kill the whole army. Right? It says there'll be a few remaining. That's what the prophecy was. He killed 185,000. In 2 Chronicles 32, it says he killed the mighty men of valor, the captains, and the leaders. Well, what kind of plague does that? I'm only killing the people of high esteem. That's some plague. That's some lightning storm. Right? Uh, no. That was the angel of the Lord. So the few that remained, that's why he had to run away. Like, how many generals do we have left? Crickets. Captains? You know, anybody. <laughs> All you got is foot soldiers. Yeah. There's a few of them. Got to go. All right? And they left. And it says, so he returned with uh, shame of his face to his own land. And when he was come into the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with a the sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and, and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. We'll see more about that in the next couple chapters. Uh, but the shadow here of Christ is that people will glorify him once he saves Israel on the planet. It also mentions in verse 22 that it saves them from Sennacherib and all others around them. Remember, Sennacherib was called a, a bramble, right, a thorn, right? Ezekiel talks about how God will save Israel from all the thorns and briars, which speaks about the curse that God put on humanity and the thorns that would come up because of man, and that God's going to save Israel from the thorns. When he saves them from the thorns, the world will be saved because there will be no more thorns. The curse is removed. And there was thorns all around the city. You had Jerusalem here surrounded by the army of thorns. Sennacherib, right? You have God's city surrounded by thorns. Jesus Christ died with a crown of thorns on his head. Okay? And I don't think it's coincidence either that it was 33 years before this event, Isaiah 37, that Ahaz rejected Isaiah as a prophet, and 33 years later, Hezekiah the king accepted Isaiah the prophet, fulfilling his prophecies. When Ahaz rejected Isaiah, he said, a virgin shall conceive, right, and give birth to Emmanuel, God is with us. 33 years later, Hezekiah is a king, and the Lord delivers Israel. 33 years, 33 years. Oh, Jesus died when he was 33 years old. Yeah. That's amazing. Just something for you to consider. This book is not an accident. Things happen when they do in this book, not accidentally. Okay? There are many chance things that occur, but not according to God's purpose in the Bible. Right? Any comments, any questions? I hope you enjoyed that. That was a fun chapter to study.